As singers, we search to produce vocal sounds that match our highest ideals. Certainly, we can produce thousands of different sounds. Not just language sounds, but tonal qualities we can continue to refine. Our quest is to sift through the possibilities, to choose one quality over another, to train ourselves to create and recreate those sounds. A major arena of our quest is our vocal tract, the resonator of the voice. But before moving to the vocal tract, let's look at a common resonator, the trumpet, and gather our intuition about resonators. To sound the trumpet, the trumpeter's breath causes the lips to vibrate, producing a buzzy sound. When the buzzy sound is sent into the tube of the trumpet, it changes dramatically. The air column inside the hollow tube resonates the vibration of the lips. And what would we expect if the tube changes size and shape to a French horn, for example? Or even larger, into a tuba? We know intuitively that changing the size and shape of the hollow tube will cause different qualities of sounds. And with trumpets, French horns, and tubas, we know the kinds of sounds these resonators produce. But what if the resonator changed into this shape? Or into a skinnier one? Imagine the change in sound for this one. Or that one. Or any of those that look like trumpets from Dr. Seuss. Or what if it kept changing from one to another continuously while playing? Is there such an instrument? Well, yes, the human voice. The shapes are taken from a soprano, Pat Carnes, whom we've just heard singing at the beginning of the tape. We can see inside the center of her head a cross section, as if sliced in half. With the use of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging technology, we can see the size and shape of the hollow spaces inside her mouth and throat as she sings from vowel to vowel. These hollow spaces form the resonance space for the voice, just as the hollow spaces in the trumpet formed its resonance and each change results in a change of tonal quality. Let's look at her consonant M, where we can see all the areas of the vocal tract. First, there is the mouth, which is sometimes called the oral cavity. Then the throat, sometimes called the pharynx. The pharynx actually has three parts, the laryngopharynx, the part nearest the larynx, the oropharynx, the part nearest the oral cavity, and the nasopharynx, the part nearest the nasal cavity. And then we have the nasal cavity itself, which is part of the resonating tube on nasal consonants and nasal vowels. Finally, there is the laryngeal tube, the small area between the vocal folds and the pharynx. As we will see, it's important to think of these areas as interconnected, as one unit, one whole hollow tube, whether it includes the nasal cavity or omits it. Let's return to our intuition about a trumpet. Like lips for the trumpet, the vocal folds create a buzzy sound for the voice. Also like a trumpet, the hollow tube of the vocal tract resonates the buzzy sound. And changing the size and shape changes the sound, just like a trumpet or French horn or tuba. We can see 
that the vocal tract is shaped by all the different parts that line it, each with unique characteristics for movement. The lips, the tongue combined with the jaw, the larynx, the spine combined with the head, the hard and soft palate, sometimes the nasal cavities, and the cheeks which line the sides. And because any change in these contours will cause a change in the size and shape of the resonator, which will cause different qualities of sound, singers learn to move the parts that affect this lining, always with finer and finer adjustments, in different combinations, different degrees, always to create better and better sounds. Let's begin by looking at the tongue. The tongue is considerably larger than many people realize. It extends from the tip in front down to the hyoid bone, located at the top of the larynx, and is the most flexible of all the movable structures. Let's watch a few images and see just how many ways it can move. The tongue can move in so many different ways because it is actually made of several muscles, which are highly innervated and so intertwined that it's impossible to tell where one begins and another ends. This complex interconnectedness allows rapid and subtle movements to occur. It is useful to think of the tongue in several parts, the tip, the blade, the front, and back, and each can move independently. Let's look at a few characteristics of tongue shape. When the air column has this particular shape, the sound we hear is the vowel E. Notice the high arch of the tongue in the forward part of the mouth, which is why this vowel is classified as a forward vowel in the International Phonetic Alphabet. And here is the shape of the vowel U. Notice that this vowel has the high arch of the tongue in the back part of the mouth which is why this vowel is called a back vowel. E, U. In fact, every vowel sound is caused by the shape of the air column and is classified by where the tongue constricts the air column. Now, let's look at the movements of the jaw, a major shaper of the vocal tract. The jaw, or mandible, is hinged to the skull with a joint called the temporal mandibular joint, or TMJ. Let's zoom in and look at this amazing joint. We can see the connection. From the skull, a membrane hangs down like a curtain. At the base, a cartilage is attached in the center. Beneath it, another membrane hangs, from which the jaw is suspended. These membranes are like two curtains, with a rod through the middle, which allows our jaw to swing in virtually any direction. The jaw can move up and down, forward and back, and even side to side. The magnetic resonance images you have been seeing have shown the fleshy part of the body, not the bones. Therefore, as we combine the jawbone with the fleshy parts from the MRI, you can clearly see that the jaw is like a cradle for the tongue, an easy moving base, a support. The tongue and jaw are intricately bound to each other. But notice as we watch a few images that they move independently, yet still together, as if in a continual dance. Obviously, a loose, free jaw will allow the tongue to move with complete freedom to gracefully shape the air column, which is why achieving an easy jaw is a major tenet of vocal pedagogy. By contrast, in the next two images, our singer demonstrates a jutting jaw, 
and shows us just how much strain it puts on the vocal tract. The jaw also affects virtually all other areas of the vocal tract. For instance, watch here along the boundary between the jaw and the tissue surrounding the larynx and see how interrelated their movements can be. Again, we can see that an easy free jaw would free the muscles surrounding the larynx, allowing the larynx and all of its muscles to move much more freely. Now, let's look at the larynx, the bottom end of the vocal tract. What we are seeing here are the vocal folds, the epiglottis, and the tissues surrounding the arytenoid cartilages, all indicating the position of the larynx. Let's watch the position of the larynx as it moves up and down. The yellow bars will help show how much the position varies, all the way from the top bar to the bottom bar. And of course, as it moves up and down, it lengthens or shortens the vocal tract. We can think of panpipes and realize that any small difference in the length of hollow tubes is enough to make a difference in the resulting sound so the position of the larynx has a dramatic effect upon vocal sound. Since the tongue is attached to the hyoid bone at the top of the larynx, its movement will also have an impact on the position of the larynx, as we see here, moving up and down, up and down. And we've already pointed out the impact the jaw can have on the larynx. There are actually many muscles that govern the position of the larynx and all interact in complex ways. But singers generally find that a soft throat is the ideal condition for all these muscles, where the throat is neither squeezed nor stretched and the larynx is in a comfortably low position, neither elevated nor depressed. Another important area is the space inside the larynx, called the laryngeal tube. Its size varies depending on the position of the epiglottis and the arytenoids. We can see this size change. Researchers believe the ring of the voice is generated in this tube. It intensifies when the cross-sectional area of the opening is six times narrower than the cross-sectional area that it opens into. Now let's look at the other end of the vocal tract, the lips. The lips shape the opening of the vocal tract, making it more open or closed, more round or spread, longer or shorter. For example, the lips are neutral here for the vowel E, but become more round and extend forward for the vowel O.